Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Well, welcome to News Room. I'm your host, Mr. Khalid Bhatt. Today is the 4th of October, 2023, and these are the stories that we'll be discussing during the course of the show. We'll be discussing uh, uh, the Afghan involvement in uh, Pakistani activities uh, in, in the recent past and in the distant past as well, and the recent statement that has come from Pakistan when it has finally decided to expel uh, the illegal foreign national. The government has also set uh, November 1st as a deadline for the illegal immigrants to leave uh, Pakistan. The decision was taken in an apex committee a meeting on the national action plan. Afghan involvement in uh, Pakistani terror incidents has been established through various proofs that have been collected over the period of time. And of course, the terror networks like the TTP are also supported by the Afghan terrorists. It has also been proven. This is what we are going to discuss during the course of our first segment. The Afghan involvement in Pakistan, despite all that Pakistan has done, for them in the last decades. Our second segment, ladies and gentlemen, concerns the United States of America, where uh, in a surprise uh, event, the United States House Speaker was removed by a vote of 216 to 210. This is the first ouster of uh, the U.S. House Speaker in the House's 234-year history, a first time that it has happened. Democrats joined hands with Republicans some of the, the of course, uh, Republicans to, uh, you know, vote out McCarthy. Kevin McCarthy's son says he is not going to run again. As a result of that, the ouster has come days after the House narrowly avoided a government uh, shutdown. Reminds us of other votes of uh, no confidence that were also done in other parts of the world. Nevertheless, let's concentrate ourselves on the United States of America, and this is going to be our second segment. Then uh, we are going to talk about Namira Saleem, uh, who is the first Pakistani woman to travel to space. Our caretaker prime minister, Mr. Kaka, has wished her good luck. He, she, uh, speaking of Namira, she's a former honorary counsel of Pakistan to Monaco. She is also to embark on this expedition with Virgin Galactic. So it's, of course, it's a, it's a wonderful experience for, for whoever. And of course, her being a Pakistani makes it even more special. Then we are going to talk about the trio that has won the physics Nobel Prize for illuminating electrons. Pierre Agostini, Frank Krauss, and Anne Lullier have won uh, the Nobel Prize for Physics. This re research enables study of electrons inside atoms and molecules. Very interesting study, and congratulations to all three of them. Finally, we'll be talking about a Qatari uh, students who have invented, ladies and gentlemen, of all things, a 3D printer to print mass vegetables. We had to come to this at one stage of our lives. Students have uh, been um, growing these uh, uh, vegetables like carrots, 3D carrots, uh, in uh, you know uh, under this uh, 3D printer. And we have heard of 3D houses. We have heard of so many other things being machines being made under 3D. But uh, vegetables being made by a 3D printer, this for uh, at least for myself is a first. But it's a very interesting uh, technological and scientific uh, achievement. And I let's see if they taste the same as well. This is going to be our last story. Let's begin with our first, and that concerns, ladies and gentlemen, the involvement of the Afghan national as far as uh, the different nefarious activities in Pakistan is concerned. There was a meeting of the National Action Plan, and as a result of that meeting, it has been decided that Pakistan will expel the illegal foreign nationals from its territory beginning from the 1st of November. This is the deadline for the illegal immigrants to leave uh, Pakistan. Uh, uh, lots of questions that emanate. We've had the reaction as well from Zabiullah Mujahid. We've had the reaction from the UNHCR as well. Nevertheless, uh, the fact remains that Pakistan has tangible proof as far as the involvement of the Afghan nationals in nefarious activities in Pakistan as well, and the support of the TTP as well. We've been joined by Sayyid Muhammad Ali, uh, international uh, security expert, who joins us in the studios. We have a second guest, Brigadier retired Rashid Wali Janjua, who's a senior analyst, will be joining us online. Uh, let's begin with our first guest in the studio. Ali, thank you very much to have joined us. Ali, how important do you feel is this announcement post the NAP meeting that was held? And how important is the directive that has been given to expel all illegal immigrants by the 1st of November. Uh, Omar, thank you for having me. I think it was long overdue. and uh, But I think it was uh, made almost uh, a necessary national security compulsion uh, because we were facing a number of national security challenges ranging from terrorist attacks to smuggling, uh, black market economy, and uh, crimes. Uh, including abductions for ransom, things like that. Uh, but I think it is a, a wiser and prudent approach by the government uh, that uh, they took a wholesome uh, overview of the situation 
And uh, what we witnessed yesterday, perhaps is in reality, is a comprehensive international uh, internal security uh, policy framework, which is which was needed, mm. but perhaps was not available. And it was seen in different segments and silos, different aspects of internal mm. security were dealt with by different departments. So I really um, appreciate uh, this prudent step that uh, the current interim government brought together the military leadership, the intelligence leadership, the uh, provincial uh, administrative units, law enforcement agencies, everybody, for the first time we saw a whole of government approach whole of Pakistan approach towards understanding, uh, identifying the challenges, coming up with a comprehensive policy mechanism uh, to address not just terrorism, but black market economy, uh, smuggling, drugs trade, and all these things. And I think it's a welcome realization that most of these problems, unfortunately, uh, were caused by uh, the illegal uh, you know, uh, aliens who were resident in Pakistan, who mm. were neither registered and were indulging in all sorts of activities ranging from drugs trade to smuggling to terrorism and so on and so forth. Okay. Ali, uh, what measures uh, do you feel the Pakistani government has taken for this voluntary repatriation of uh, all the illegal immigrants by the 1st of November? And for those who do not comply by the 1st of November, what are the measures that should be or would be taken? I think it's a very um, carefully considered uh, graduated uh, roadmap towards improving our internal security mechanism. Uh, the next four weeks are available. Uh, so I see uh, three categories of uh, um, foreign nationals resident in Pakistan, those who are documented and are on visa. Second, those who have some documents, not visa, but some sort of, uh, you know, document. The third who have no document. Mm. So um, while those who are uh, well documented have nothing to fear and uh, they have legitimate visas, the second people have an incentive to get them registered. The third, the illegal residents, they also have four weeks to either get themselves registered or to leave the country. Mm. And beyond uh, first November, I think Pakistan will and I think must and should behave like any sovereign, self-respecting, normal state that anybody who does not have a legitimate visa uh, has no right uh, to be in Pakistan. All right. Rashid Wali Janjua Saab joins us online. Janjua Saab, thank you very much to have joined us. Uh, Janjua Saab, in your point of view, what are the factors that have contributed to this strained relationship between Pakistan and the Afghan refugees, particularly if we look in the context of uh, the different security concerns that Pakistan has had and the recent terrorist attacks as well that have grabbed Pakistan? Sorry, could you, Sorry, could you, could you repeat, repeat your question? question? Yes, I'll repeat it. Uh, Janjua sir, I was trying to ask you what in your point of view have been uh, the factors that have contributed to the strained relationship between Pakistan and the Afghan uh, uh, immigrants, the Afghan refugees, particularly if we look in the context of the security apparatus of Pakistan, the security issues of Pakistan and the recent terrorist attacks. Uh, when, when we talk of uh, strained relations between uh, the Afghan refugees in Pakistan, I think we should frame it uh, very carefully because uh, it's a sovereign country. And if anybody comes and recorded the status of a refugee, there are certain rules according to which they have to live. And if they are not refugees, they are illegal aliens and have to be dealt accordingly. Uh, we know that there are uh, 1.4 million registered uh, refugees and which are being uh, taken care of by Pakistan. UNHCR is also actively involved. We have their data, but we don't have a data of uh, some, something around 2.4 million who are uh, here without any valid documents. And it is that category that is the focus of uh, the present efforts. And then there is yet another category that is uh, that comprises 0.7 million, 7 lakh which have come from 2021 onwards after the uh, withdrawal of U.S. troops. So all these three categories have to be treated differently. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, tell you that uh, 
in the last 74 years of our existence this practice was on where the tribes from uh, where the people from afghanistan would cross over on the basis of uh, a document that was called tazkara and uh, that was according to the easement rights uh, law that was uh, in practice since the british uh, colonial times that the tribes living uh, a certain kilometers on that side of the uh, border and certain kilometers this side of the border that they are the divided tribes and they could come and do their business and go back so many people misuse that tazkara uh, document they used to come and they used to move down country so most of the uh, afghans that went to karachi they went to quetta uh, they started changing the demographic pattern and the first complaints came from the local uh, locals of the area from peshawar from quetta from karachi that these people who come and some of them uh, were involved into smuggling illegal uh, activities they had a lot of money so they could buy property and they were displacing the local businesses as well then we know that uh, uh, the figures have been given that how many afghans uh, who are here without any document have been involved in crimes as well and uh, then there are certain uh, activities which are being carried out through involvement of uh, our uh, you know certain uh, uh, departments who are responsible for the border management so i think uh, this is a decision which is uh, which will impact uh, the organized crime the border smuggling and uh, this would be a big step and another thing which did not happen so far and a lot of recommendations were given in the past for that that there should be one document that everybody should come on passport and visa and uh, this for some reasons kept hanging fire no decision was taken and the credit goes to the present political uh, and military dispensation that they have taken a very bold decision and they have uh, included visa and passport requirement as the basic requirement from 1st november onwards which is a revolutionary step this is something that we must all register we must all understand that from here onwards there will be no tazkara cross border movement of the authorized crossing points would be uh, with the help of passport and a duly stamped visa and this will create obviously the problems because uh, there are so many afghan refugees who are unaccounted for they have to be they will uh, voluntarily they will submit for registration or they will go back or they will have to be uh, you know forcibly registered caught there the role of uh, whole of society comes to play because uh, people have to identify or there are organized mafias there is a whole ecosystem of crime there are uh, trans- transport mafias there are business mafias and uh, there are cross border movement facilitation mafias so all of those elements have to be factored in our border management apparatus has to be specially firmed up and a special monitoring has to be done on uh, all the agencies and all the departments that are responsible for border management including customs including law enforcement agencies that uh, are responsible to stop any illegal flow from afghanistan to pakistan here onwards it's all order and easy thing to uh, achieve because the practices and the customs that have been uh, established for decades and rather over centuries uh, when we uh, passport uh, requirement of course it, of course uh, is that issue rashid but i can understand sir that this is an issue and of course we uh, understand the backdrop of it all as well the decision hasn't been an easy one but the decision as you yourself said is a bold one nevertheless uh, reactions have come uh, say ali uh, as far as international organizations are concerned even at cr for one we've got zabula mujahid who's reacted as well how do you see the role of international organizations let's come to even at cr and others as far as uh, the presence of afghan uh, nationals in pakistani territories concerned do you feel they could also assist pakistan 
in this uh, voluntary movement of uh, the Afghan nationals and post November 1 as well? Do you feel they will help? They can help? Uh, thank you so much. I think uh, realistically speaking, the humanitarian uh, crisis that Afghan nation faces is an international challenge. Mm. And, but it is not, let me point out, a unilaterally Pakistan challenge. Mm. So if, uh, uh, and Pakistan, I think, has uh, made more sacrifices and made more contribution uh, in humanitarian domain, but also legally and diplomatically in trying to convince the international community that Afghanistan and the Afghani people deserve the assistance and help of the international institutions and the international community. However, we have genuine uh, and very serious uh, internal security concerns mm. regarding smuggling, regarding black market, regarding drugs trade, regarding terrorism, uh, for which unfortunately uh, the current Afghan administration has not uh, lived up to the expectations mm. and fulfilled its international security obligations under um, you know, the uh, ages of Doha Accord. Uh, towards the international community in general, but in particular Pakistan mm. as well. So what uh, decisions have been taken by Pakistan are, uh, are a compulsion uh, directly out of our national security considerations. However, when it comes to the plight of the, uh, the Afghan people and the challenges that they face, I think it is an international uh, issue. Mm. And the interna entire international community and all the international institutions, including UNHCR and others, mm. uh, and the European Union and United Nations, must come forward in trying to help the um, Afghan people uh, improve their life, stabilize themselves, uh, meet their challenges. Uh, however, I think uh, the the consequence and cost of the Afghan instability, uh, lack of governance cannot be uh, unilaterally and disproportionately borne by the Pakistani nation and state anymore. Hmm, that is true. Ali, I'd also like to refer to what the interior minister said and he pointed out to what 24 suicide attacks that have happened till now since the month of January with 14 bombings carried out by Afghan nationals such as Peshawar police lines blast, Kalasai Fullah operation, Job hmm. Kant attack and last week's attacks in Khaybar Pakhtunkhwa's uh, Hangu uh, as well. Do you feel these are the decisions that prompted uh, the Pakistani government to take this decision? I think it's one of the, the recent spike uh, in terrorism and like you rightly pointed out, uh, it's not a coincidence that most of these attacks uh, not only uh, stem from the Afghan territory but actually involve Afghan citizens uh, in, in exploding themselves and killing Pakistani citizens. So as a citizen of Pakistan, I expect uh, the Afghan government to take responsibility uh, towards the international community but particularly mm. uh, towards Pakistan and mm. of also ensuring that no Afghan citizens are involved in any anti-state terrorist activities uh, against any other country particularly Pakistan. Mm. So when we say let me frankly and bluntly mm. say mm -hmm. this that uh, uh, when Afghani individuals are involved in terrorist attacks in Pakistan mm. this represents an inability or lack of will on the capacity uh, on the part of Afghan government mm. to ensure its citizens are not involved in any terrorist attacks. Mm. Uh, so I think the humanitarian aspect is important but mm. that cannot be an excuse and pretext uh, to justify and legitimize and ignore uh, the you know, failure of the Afghan administration mm. to ensure that its citizens, its nationals and its territory is not used against any other country, particularly Pakistan. How do you see the re reaction by Sabiullah Mujahid? He says, and I quote, Pakistan's decision to expel undocumented Afghan nationals was unacceptable and urged authorities to revisit the policy. I think, let me explain why he said it. Um, because uh, it's an unfortunate reality that uh, uh, in the absence of diplomatic recognition, in the absence of their, uh, you know, being mainstreamed in the international banking channel, primarily the most of Afghan economy is run on black market economy. Hmm. So when Pakistan is documenting its economy, is cracking down on smuggling and black economy, and also against terrorist attacks, and also uh, registering. Uh, the illegal aliens or evicting those mm. who are who do not ha have uh, legitimate right or documents then obviously it indicates why the Afghans are concerned but I expect if Afghan government 
an Afghan uh, nation expects to be respected, accommodated, and recognized as a normal, law-abiding member of the international community, then I think the onus and obligation is on Kabul administration to ensure uh, it behaves normally, responsibly, and ensures its citizens and the territory is not used against any other country, particularly Pakistan. Of course, uh, going towards uh, Janjua Saab, Rashid Ali Janjua Saab, you remember the first uh, uh, you know, address that was made by Amir Muttaki, the interim foreign minister of uh, Afghanistan, was said, uh, was included the fact and the statement that the Afghan territory will not be used for uh, any nefarious purposes against its uh, you know, uh, regional countries or neighboring countries. In fact, the opposite happened since, in the, since the last two years. We have been witnessing uh, on and off activities that have included elements that have uh, permeated from the Afghan border into Pakistan and have uh, uh, caused instability through events uh, that are related to terrorism. Uh, in, the, in all of this context, and of course, you have told us of the decision taken as far as the, uh, you know, uh, the expulsion of uh, all the undocumented uh, Afghan uh, nationals are concerned. What happens for the fair and voluntary repatriation process for the Afghan nationals who could have legitimate reasons to stay in Pakistan? The reasons are very obvious. We have a destabilized Afghanistan. There are no economic opportunities. That was... Uh, in a war kind of a, sort of active war for, for about two decades. And uh, the conflict economy that thrived on organized crime, people came here in search of uh, economic opportunities. Then for pure security needs also, many were uh, because of the operations that were being carried out by US troops. And after that, there was an internecine fight. So they came because of all those reasons. And they find uh, the avenues of uh, economic uh, entrepreneurship in Pakistan much more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, much more suitable compared to Afghanistan. That is why I said that there are uh, people, traders from Shahar and uh, even Quetta, and you are very concerned about. Uh, rise in their population of undocumented Afghan and even those come and get uh, citizenship because then it alters the demographic pattern also. Uh, there's a question of uh, property ownership also and the smuggling that continues, uh, it enables those uh, who are coming illegally to purchase the property and once the elements get in uh, get hold of the property you can see they develop uh, their inroads into society then the drug smuggling and all of the uh, there are a lot of explanations for the reasons that Pakistan government has taken as the basis to uh, take this decision that is important as far as the security of Pakistan and the future of Pakistan is concerned. And I think it's a, a step taken in the right direction at the right time, seeing what has been happening in Pakistan in the last two years. Thank you very much, Rashid Wali Janjua Saab, uh, Brigadier Retired Rashid Wali Janjua, senior analyst joining us online to discuss this issue. Finally, uh, Ali, what in your point of view are the expected outcomes or the impacts of this decision on Pakistan's internal security, domestic relations, regional stability, and in case uh, there are certain challenges that emanate out of it, how can Pakistan the, uh, you know, address these complex challenges effectively? I think there are three aspects to it. Uh, first is the diplomatic one, the second is uh, uh, the economic one, and the third is security one. Um, I think you must have noticed that uh, Pakistan is taking a more robust approach towards uh, Afghan administration uh, based on uh, you know our bitter experiences in the last two years because of the failure of uh, the Kabul administration to meet its international obligations, particularly the security commitment vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pakistan. The second is uh, the security dimension, which is the most worrying and represents a major uh, national security challenge for Pakistan because uh, the, this uh, spike in the terrorist attacks uh, needs to be addressed uh, and, and I think uh, it is very unfortunate uh, and worrying that most of these attacks are, uh, you know, emanating from either uh, the Afghan territory or actually directly involves Afghan individuals 
physically involved in these attacks. So both those things are um, you know, not uh, tolerable. And the third is the economic aspect. Uh, we have realized that uh, a significant part of our uh, you know, economic challenges are directly dependent and caused by the black economy uh, of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, which which is a huge uh, you know challenge for Pakistan as well so when while we are documenting our economy we are regulating our economy and and let me add uh, uh, to your knowledge that uh, only uh, yesterday a new in line with the decisions made yesterday uh, a SRO a statutory rectification order was issued to regulate and monitor and document uh, the transit trade agreement vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan to ensure it is not used as a pretext for smuggling and black marketing uh, inside Pakistan. Mm. So these things are being done uh, not against Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. We are not against Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. We are doing it only to document and better manage our own economy, uh, to document it, which is an international obligation mm. legally uh, as per FATF as well. We have international obligation, I think, I, according to IMF and World Bank as well. They, international financial institutions expect Pakistan to have regulated, documented economy. So on one side, it is not possible for Pakistan to, uh, you know, continue to, uh, you know, uh, offer humanitarian assistance, uh, which, uh, or sympathy at the cost of its own internal and national security. I think Pakistan is meeting international obligations vis-a-vis -vis documenting its economy, but if that requires documenting all the individuals, I think Afghan administration uh, should uh, understand that and also reciprocate these measures in their own uh, national interest with, within the Afghan territory on Afghan uh, citizens so that they also make uh, uh, you know uh, their recognition and uh, international uh, accommodation in the international community as a responsible mm. state in their own interests. Well. That is true and of course there's the security angle as well that is equally important as much as the economic angle is and the diplomatic angle that you've uh, alluded towards. Thank you very much Sayyid Mohammed Always Ali, a pleasure. internal security expert who have joined us and who have come out the way to the studios to have uh, talked to us on this very very important issue. I think it's yeah. very pertinent in this day and age under the circumstances that we are involved in that a decision like this is taken and uh, needs to be uh, uh, you know uh, implemented in the right uh, letter and spirit. Thank you very much, Ali, to have joined us. Thank you. Let's come to our second story, and that concerns the United States of America and how Kevin McCarthy has been removed by a margin of 260 to 210 votes. What is this going to vote for U.S. politics, and what example is this making as far as regional and international politics is uh, concerned? More in the following report. In a significant turn of events on Capitol Hill, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, a prominent Republican figure has been removed from his position. This historic development marks a pivotal moment in American politics, sending shocking waves throughout the nation. The decision to remove McCarthy from his role as House Speaker came following growing discontent within the Republican Party. Critics argued that McCarthy's leadership had become increasingly divisive and ineffective, particularly in the face of pressing national challenges. Tensions reached a boiling point as a group of dissident Republicans pushed for a change in leadership to better address the needs of their constituents. The removal process began with a series of closed-door meetings and negotiations where key members of the Republican Party voiced their concerns about McCarthy's ability to lead effectively. Ultimately, a majority of the Republican caucus decided to remove him from his position, citing the need for a fresh approach and more unity within the party. This development has far-reaching implications for both the Republican Party and the broader political landscape. The selection of a new House Speaker will undoubtedly shape the party's direction and priorities in the coming years, especially as the nation grapples with critical issues such as health care, immigration and the economy. As the nation watches closely, the removal of Kevin McCarthy as House Speaker underscores the fluid and ever-evolving nature of American politics. It remains to be seen how this change in leadership will impact the dynamics on Capitol Hill and the country as a whole. 
to discuss this issue. We've been joined in the studio by Dr. Farah Naz. She's an expert in international affairs. Farah, thank you very much to have joined us. What led to the removal of Kevin McCarthy as the House Speaker? In your point of view, what were the key events that, you know, suddenly we see this outcome and, you know, something that we had never seen in more than three centuries history of the United States of America happens. And, you know, the collaboration between, between Democrats and Republicans for this ouster is also something that is, uh, for me, comes as a surprise. What's your take on that? Thank you, Umar. Uh, yes, it's indeed a very big surprise for all of us. It's not only for Americans, but for the rest of the world as well. Because American politics has never witnessed it. And uh, if this is happening, this means something is really uh, strange that is leading towards such a big change that mm. has never happened in the past, you know, two and a half centuries so mm. far. 234 years to be precise. Exactly. Mm. So it's, it's a bit too strong coming uh, from the American politics. Uh, but we need to see the broader side of the picture. We can see that Americans, each American individual, irrespective of they are sitting in the government or they're outside the government, they are facing lots of difficulties in dealing with their daily, day-to-day -day life. Mm. Um, the major problem that I can see is why it led towards the McCarthy's, uh, you know, withdrawal or, you know, forced kind of withdrawal mm. from mm. the office was based on the debt that America is facing at this stage. Really, it is all dependent because of uh, the debt? Because of the whole issue. The, I mean, the whole government was about to be shut down, but of course, they were they averted yeah. a shutdown, a second shutdown in recent years, in fact. Yeah. So, uh, it's not only the debt, mm. uh, but poor policies mm. leading towards such kind of debt that America has never witnessed before. Mm. Uh, when we look at the graph, the graph is growing too stronger and it is now speculated that in times to come the debt is going to be too much for for the for individual American to handle. At the moment the cost of the debt on each American is more than like 900 something mm. which they have never witnessed. Along with that there's a financial annual deficit as well uh, that is 2.2 trillion something. So when we combine all these factors this is leading towards problems for uh, the you know uh, all the, the counties based or the local administration to deal with the problems that Americans are facing today uh, then secondly there were there, there's a lot of debate and discussion going on about the payments that are pending due to the Ukrainian uh, conflict and war and where America and, and the Congress they were and especially McCarthy was promising all the, the mm. representatives that they that he's going to bring such policies where where uh, they're going to overcome all the gaps and the, and the differences, but it's not going to happen. And people are so uh, offended with that that they want to change everything. Maybe uh, they just want to focus on themselves because the statements that are coming up from the representatives like Matt Gates, he says that uh, we want to have such a person in, in this on this seat who can take America first mm. rather than someone else first. America first should be our slogan and our narrative. And um, I'm, I'm not saying that they're wrong in justifying that because they have been engaged in wars from ages and ages, mm. like from my mm. childhood to mm. this age and even in the future, they are planning a long way of conflict. So uh, they have been involved in Vietnam, they have been involved in Iraq, Libya, uh, Syria, Afghanistan, uh, now Ukraine, one way or the other. They have been also a part and parcel like in, in, the, in the proxy wars as well. So probably um, Americans are now realizing that it is leading towards their uh, uh, demise and their problem where they are facing dollarization, de-dollarization. And they can't see if dollar, the value of dollar is getting affected, what will be the future for mm. America? But you know, Farah, I'd like to understand, you know, I, uh, now that the Austria <laughs> has happened, there was, of course, a difference of six votes uh, yeah. between the pro and the cons and you know, yes and the no. But nevertheless, uh, the difference is there. Uh, ouster of Kevin McCarthy, what is going to be the outcome of it? And do you feel there is, uh, as we see that there were some uh, Republicans that joined hands with the Democrats in ousting Kevin McCarthy, do you feel there's going to be some kind of uh, direct or indirect consensus for the future, uh, you know, Speaker of uh, the U.S. House as well? Consensus between whom? Between the Rep Republicans because, and, and the, the Democrats? And the Democrats. And what kind of candidate do you s foresee? Uh, you saw you talked about America first, yeah. but what kind of do you feel that there's going to be a, a candidate that will be that will have the approval of both the Republicans and the Democrats? B now that Kevin McCarthy is not uh, is not there, there is a uh, you know a gap between uh, till the time a new yeah. uh, you know speaker is elected. What happens in this time? What is the outcome um, of you know this removal on the America's national and international yeah. politics? 
Uh, well, to be very precise, um, at the moment, America is having 45 days of spending left to support their government and uh, to support their defense spendings even. Mm. So, um, and they have 45 days of getting another person to sit here to manage the affairs. Uh, because this is not an ordinary position. This is a very strong mm. position. Mm. This is a candidate who kind of manages all the Congress affairs. And um, at this point in time where they have to make certain payments for the Ukraine as well. So it's mm. a very crucial moment for them where they are struggling with making the payments done within and even outside uh, the promises that they have made, but they are not able to fulfill all of those. So within 45 days, they have to get another person. But Again, uh, McHenry, who is uh, the acting speaker at the moment, mm. uh, he cannot stay there for more than three days. But does he have the same power as uh, I don't McCarthy? see that. I don't see that. Because he is an acting head mm. and he is only there for just two to three days, mm. what he can do. Mm. He cannot make uh, or take such kind of strong decisions that um, a normal speaker can take when he is sitting on this seat. And secondly, uh, taking decisions at this crucial time requires uh, you know, a strong commitment from all the, um, the, the members of the representative and, the, and the, at least the, the leading party at least. So uh, we can see there is a division. There is also some controversial uh, discussion going on among the representatives that who says that probably President Trump the former pre, uh, the president of America he is manipulating the system and probably he is uh, bringing the rift within the the leading party at the moment um, but President Trump says that I'm and there's also speculation that probably he wants to sit here on this seat mm -hmm. so he can manage the affairs but, but he's he, involved himself in so yes. many you know uh, judicial uh, constraints that I, yeah, I don't but he denied impossible. but he denied mm. all these kind of uh, speculation and he said that I am not um, looking or eyeing on this position because I'm going to context elections uh, which are going to happen next mm. year so it's all very crucial things are very serious you know, what is also very crucial is the legislative process yeah. in the House of Representatives uh, where particularly when we talk of passing the bills or the legislative process yeah. per se what is the significance of McCarthy's removal for all of for, or for this legislative process? Is it going to slow it down? What happens with the passing of the uh, bills? What happens with the legislative agenda of the House of Representatives now? But things will stop because if there is no speaker in the House at the moment, mm. of course things will stop and the, the bills are not going to be do, going to the normal way and the normal mm. procedure is not going to be followed. Uh, if we specifically talk about the legislative aspects. But see, we have to look at not only this particular thing, but the broader picture. This is what I'm emphasizing on. And the broader picture depicts that America is facing three major problems. One is the debt that I've already mm, spoken mm, mm, about. Mm. Another is the health crisis that they are dealing with. The third one is aging population. So um, America is uh, a country who is spending more and more on uh, the health. Like mm. each American uh, like cost on the health is around $12,555. It's too heavy and mm. too too much for of a cost, for, of a cost mm. and mm. for a country who, whose economy is really getting affected with each passing day. Mm. Secondly, um, I would say that um, I will go back to the Ukraine, Russia-Ukraine crisis that when this crisis happened and there were sanctions imposed on um, Russia and uh, then Afghanistan when they were freezing their assets and all, um, states like Japan, which is a very strong ally of America, they also withdrew their funds. Uh, China did that, followed by many other countries. So that also led towards a huge gap into the existing revenues or in, in, in the existing um, economic or financial resources of America, leading towards de-dollarization, mm. which America is not was not realizing at that time that how weaker policies or policies who are very focused on a specific country or area or region will affect them as well. They never thought about it. But of course, uh, every action has a reaction. So when they were getting involved into such kind of sanctions and using sanctions as a tool of war and a weapon, this led towards curiosity among all other states whose assets were up there in America or in the Western countries. They thought our assets are not safe. And if we are in the good books of uh, these countries, our assets are safe and secure. If we are not, they can freeze our assets as well. So withdrawing those assets also led towards de-dollarization in America, leading towards serious economic crisis. At the moment, what Americans want is they want to focus on themselves. For mm. them, American individual American citizen, their priorities, their interest is only that is their, the first interest. The first the interest. Okay. They don't care about what's happening mm. in the world. And probably they're tired of wars. 
They mm. don't want to get involved into someone else's conflict, mm. someone else's business. Mm. They just want to f fix their own and, and get involved into their own businesses so they can manage their affairs. So Farah, what happens to the political landscape as far as the, as the US is concerned? Internal politics. Well, uh, President Trump is in crisis. Mm. Frankly speaking, uh, President Biden is in crisis mm. due to the policies or the, the decisions that he has taken. Probably they want to have a new face or somebody who can, like, as I mentioned, three major crises that they are going through. Uh, one is the debt, uh, health, mm. and uh, the over uh, elderly population. Mm. Somebody who can come up with uh, a narrative that we can do this for Americans and like election campaign is going to begin very soon. Of course, it's, in it's, next it's year. about mm. it's about mm. to begin. So somebody who can promote these kind of narratives that we will give you this and that that person is going to win uh, the entire show. Are we going to have a new face as far as the Republicans are concerned for the presidential uh, nominee in 2024? What's your take? Um, maybe. Uh, uh, but I don't know. It's, it's a bit too early at this stage mm. because at this time we were never ever, um, you know, even assuming that something like this can happen. So if this can happen, anything can happen in America or anywhere in the world. Mm. All what we need to focus is that uh, probably the world is tired of the entire maneuvering and all of that and they just want to focus on themselves because mm. they end of the day if you are there you can live your life the way you want to if your, li your life is threatened you cannot do anything that is up there for you and um, uh, one thing uh, that the states are realizing is that uh, money is power and unless and until you're economically strong enough to sustain and to take your position you cannot lead so if you want to lead, you have to be economically very strong. So to get that position, America, of course, is the superpower of today. And uh, they want to, the people of America, they are very really proud of that. They want to, to, to maintain their position mm. in the world. But True. for maintaining their position, they need strong leadership. And mm. for strong leadership, they need to have strong candidates who can look after their affairs rather than they getting involved in other people's businesses. Final question, short answer, Farah. What happens to the Ukraine military aid now that Andy McCarthy is no yeah. longer there? Ukraine military aid, I would say, is um, America kind of played a bit nasty over there. They were short of their own uh, weaponry and all. They were short of their resources as well. So they were even, in terms of providing the weapons, they were asking third countries to mm. that you provide your weapons to this country, and then mm. from there we will take it, like you know, breaking all the the, the deals and the ties that they they promised. Uh, regarding the payments, I think Ukraine is going to suffer with that. And they should never ever have get involved into someone else's war. I'm, I'm talking about Ukrainians. All right, that's your take on it. Thank you very much, Dr. Farah Naz, international affairs expert, to have, to have come all the way to the studios to discuss this very important issue that we see for the, uh, as a first as far as U.S. Yeah. politics is concerned, the ouster of the uh, Speaker of the U.S. House, uh, Kevin McCarthy, who has now no, no longer, and of course, uh, by a short margin, 216 to 210, but nevertheless, and that both uh, the Democrats and the Republicans ousted him together. Some Republicans, but... And, uh, yeah, and one more thing before we finish it. Mm. Uh, even McCarthy says that he like he can uh, contest the uh, the but the process mm. again, mm. but he says no. No, he he says he's not going to I run again. I am not going to do that. So, I think so he, he feels accepted. Rejected. He accepted his rejection mm. altogether. That's a big thing. Mm, that is all, yeah. and that that's part of any democracy yeah. to accept rejection whenever it happens. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay. Farhan, to have joined us. Kindly stay here. We just have two minutes before we finish the show. Let's come to our last three segments, uh, ladies and gentlemen, very very quickly. The first concerns uh, Nimra Salim, who's Pakistan's first astronaut. She's going into space uh, with the Virgin Atlantic, Virgin Galactic uh, rather, uh, and uh, our caretaker Prime Minister, Mr. Anwarullah Kakar Saab, has of also congratulated her in a tweet that he posted recently. She, uh, Nimra, Namira Saleem, uh, let me rephrase it, Namira Saleem has always dreamed of reaching the wire since childhood. She was officially introduced as Pakistan's first astronaut in the year 2006 by the government of Pakistan. She's also the first uh, she has the distinction of being the first Pakistani to have reached the North Pole in the past. She has also skydived from the Mount Everest in 2008 and the first Asian to skydive from Mount Everest. So, of course, this, this challenge, this, you know, this passion uh, to uh, do uh, the, the something that hasn't been done before by a woman, it has always been there in Namira. And that is why now she is now part of this upcoming Galactic 4 space mission uh, for which uh, we, of course, all over Pakistan are extremely overjoyed. We'll be seeing the first Pakistani woman in space and I hope she uh, does have a great voyage and she has lots to tell us when she returns from that. She makes us proud and we will be looking forward to her endeavors.
observers in the future as well. Next, uh, the Lobel Prize in Physics has been given to three atomic physicists, Frank Krauss of Hungary and, uh, and Austria, Pierre Agostini of France, and Anne Luillier of France and Sweden. Now, they have received the Nobel uh, Prize on Physics for their work developing instruments of studying electrons inside atoms and molecules. Uh, the trio was honored for experimental methods that generate attosecond pulses for of light for the study of electron dynamics in matter. Maybe too scientific for you to understand, but nevertheless, the fact remains that crux is that these three have gotten the Nobel uh, Prize in Physics. And of course, this highlights the fact that scientific discovery, if made in the right direction with the, the right passion, always need uh, leads to the right results. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let's come to our last story, and that is the 3D printed carrots. I mean, this is something that, you know, I had thought uh, maybe uh, would never happen in my lifetime, but it's happening. 3D carrots, let's hope they taste as good as the natural carrots are. Qatari scientists are aiming to make food uh, accessible to people all over the world with this newly invented 3D printer that can print the vegetables as well. Uh, these two students in Qatar have created a 3D printer that can mass print vegetables, something they hope could be a solution for growing food insecurity worldwide. Let's hope these printers will be available in mass uh, in the future as well and that they, the carrots that are uh, made through these printers will be less expensive than the carrots that we can see in the market and maybe more nutritious. Who knows? Time will tell. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to an end of today's news and we'll see you inshallah tomorrow with new story segments that pertain to us. You and Pakistan, stay safe. Allah Hafiz.